Yeah, darling. Say the percent to participants. Smaller mate, it's going to cover everything. They can't see this. They can't see that. No. Yeah. Guys, can everybody hear me? Yep. We will be yeah. better soon. We're getting some speakers going around. Oh, we can, mate. I can actually hear you quite well, uh, better now. Um, you probably haven't got the speaker hooked up as yet. Yeah, I'm better. Yes. yes. Awesome. That's great, guys. Um, can you see the um, presentation at all? Yep. Yep. Just yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Awesome, guys. Um, I think we're just waiting on a couple more people and then we can get into it. How does that sound? I'd start, Brent, if you don't mind. Yeah, no worries. Okay then, guys. Well, um, thank you very much for inviting me to um, to have a have a talk to you guys. Yeah, no, no, you're right. Um, yeah, thank you very much, guys. It's been um, and my journey's been quite a journey, and I'm sure you guys um, are very well faced with that journey as well. Of um, you know, just pretty poor and depleted environment that we have these days. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background about myself, uh, just so you've got an idea. Um, I basically am, haven't been to university. Um, I'm not an agronomist, but I have worked in this industry or in the soil industry for probably the last 14 odd years. Um, my approach to soil is quite different to, um, to what we see conventionally now that, nowadays. Um, how I basically started was I had, um, well, I still have a tree business and I had all this mulch and I didn't know what to do with it. So I thought I would start making compost. And um, the first thing I did was employ an agronomist out of Perth and he came down and he said, the first thing I should do is add manures to my compost. And as I was walking through my property, I looked around at all the trees and the trees were, I was looking at them and going, well, these trees have got no, manures um they're just living on their own, own own ecosystem so i went away and i started googling about the rainforest and forests thinking you know the most pristine environment and from there i um 
I, I brought a microscope and then I started going around to forests all around the southwest of where we live in Western Australia and collecting leaf litter and actually breeding biology, which is um, pretty out there and pretty, very different. Um, we now work in over oh, probably 50, 60 different industries across West Australia. Um, all the way from the uh, uh, grain industry. Uh, last year, we did about 50,000 hectares inoculated of biology, um, right through to avocados, sugarcane, Queensland, um, Victoria. So we work all, all around, basically, um, all around Australia, really. Um, we also do work in Denmark uh, and places like that over, overseas. Um, my approach to um soil and soil biology is is it's quite different uh, it's a different thought pattern and i hope today that i'll be able to um give you guys a bit more of an idea about how we can we can look at things more sustainably um and and, and really work out there's a story behind everything every soil and it's working out that story so welcome again um I've fortunately enough had a couple of soil samples that were sent over uh, that I looked at the chemistry on um, because chemistry is a very important um, part of, of, of the system, of the biological system. Um, so basically what I've done is I've, I've, we're going to jam a lot into this session, um, but I really would like to talk about the chemistry in your soil. Um, We've found techniques and developed techniques that can actually start to unlock your soil. Um, so the first part of the presentation is going to be more based around um, what's going on with you guys over there. Um, you guys have obviously lots of magnesium in your soil. In West Australia, we have a totally different problem. We have aluminium and we have aluminium at toxic levels. Um, and basically over here and out in a very low carbon, very much like yourself. Um, and in those particular soils, um, that, that's a big fight in itself, trying to get aluminium out of our soils. Two parts per million of aluminium is, is, is basically sort of borderline toxicity to your plant. Uh, over here, we see it up to 90 parts per million. And um, so basically all the, all the, the soils doing is holding the plant up uh, and then massive chemical use on top, uh, which is actually depleting our soils even further. So, well, can everyone hear me all right still? Yep. Yeah, sorry guys, it sounds a bit quiet, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, just because I'm not an agronomist or, um, or a, a university um, professor, um, I have had lots of experience, massive amounts of experience with extremely good results across the board. Um, and um, so please don't be scared to ask me questions. Um, I'm more than happy to answer to my best of ability. All the, um, all the um, knowledge that I've gained over many years is based on reality, working with growers. And, um, and there's probably gonna throw a few things on their heads for you guys, um, which I hope that will be the case. Okay, so the first stage really is, I mean, can you see that all right, guys? Yep, yep. Okay, what soils are made up? This is just a bit of, um, you know, I mean, as we can see, it's just getting, I just want to just sort of highlight a few things which are particularly important, um, particularly the mineral side and the organic matter side, which I know you guys are lacking, but we're going to look at how we can rectify those, those issues. Um, you know, standard, most soils, organic matter is 5%. Uh, West Australia, we go down to 03 And you guys are probably around the same, I can, uh, going back to your soil test. Uh, Shumis is extremely important. He's the guy that, that basically stores carbon or organic matter, breaks it down and stores it as a, as a, um, as a basically a stable form of, um, of carbon. Um, which can be utilised by biology, can you be utilised for by plants. Shumis will hold anywhere between four to five times its own weight in water. Extremely, extremely important guy. 
Um, roots obviously are in the ground. Um, a lot of the soils over here, we um, basically after harvest, that's it. We won't get any roots. They'll, they'll, they'll get broken down by biology. So these roots are also very important part of the organic matter. Um, and then you've got the organisms at 10%. Now there's different types of organisms. Some are really good, some are really bad, but we'll discuss that as we go. Um, next page, all right. I can't see it because I've got all these things in here. So yeah, just a little bit about plant photosynthesis. Um, uh, I just need to bring this down a bit. Sorry guys. Um, yeah, plants need three things, carbon dioxide, water and sunlight. Um, by taking in water through the roots, carbon dioxide from air and light energy from the sun then releases oxygen to the atmosphere. Plants perform photosynthesis to make predominantly sugars or glucose. So under photosynthesis, what they do is they, they produce sugars. Those sugars get passed around through the plants, um, through the stems, through the leaves. Um, any excesses they have, they drop them out through the root system and they feed the biology in the soil, okay? That's one way that biology or specific species um, live. They live on those sugars, okay? Uh, anyone have any questions on that one? All good? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's all yeah. good. Sorry, guys, it just sounds really quiet. It sounds like I'm talking to myself. Um, <laughs> right. Um, It's not turning, it's not changing. Okay, now has anyone heard much about mineral antagonisms? Anyone out there? Oh, only from what you've said, Grant. <laughs> yeah, okay, mate. Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be touching more on the mineral side of things before we get into the biology. So it's it's extremely important that we um, we understand this. Um, what I tend to find these days with, with modern day agronomy is that um, we tend to look at our deficiencies opposed to the problem. Or well, you, you know what I mean? Like, for example, you guys have got magnesium issues. So when we talk about antagonisms, um, magnesium is amazing at locking out calcium. Uh, magnesium locks out, um, what else does it lock out, Lise? It locks out... Um, Phosphorus, locks out potassium, locks out all different things. So what we tend to find with modern day agronomy is they look at a soil test and they go, oh, you need more phosphorus and you need more potassium or you need more calcium. But re reality says it doesn't matter how much of that you throw out into the system. Um, if, if, if magnesium is your dominating factor, which it is in your soil, um, we tend to find that you can throw out to the cows come home and you're never gonna see a change. So when we talk about antagonisms, we're talking about actual things that are locking or, or minerals that are locking out other minerals, ones that are dominant more than others. Um, you know, additional, uh, as you see down the bottom there, additions of synthetic fertilizers will not improve the balance until the ag, uh, ag antagonism is identified and unlocked. Extremely, extremely important. We've had amazing, amazing results um, purely working on the antagonisms and the dominating factor opposed to that scattergun approach of trying to um, throw products out there to uh, rectify the problem, which really is not the answer. Okay. So everyone can see this molder chart. Can you see this, guys? Come on. Okay, this is a molder chart. Now, if we go to the very top, we see P, phosphorus, right? Now, if you have a look, it's got an arrow. And if you, if you follow the first line, it's going down to aluminium. So see how we have an arrow running down? So basically, in an arrow coming up. So what that means is if phosphorus is dominating in your soil, he will lock out aluminium. If aluminium's um, dominant in your soil, he will lock out phosphorus. So you can also see uh, copper, it locks out manganese, it locks out zinc, locks out magnesium, mm -hmm. um, it just locks out everything. Um, so guys that are using superfos, I tend to find this is a major issue in, the, in their programs where they're locking out all the good stuff. Um, so this molder chart's a really, really interesting um, um, way of looking at your, well, interpreting, interpreting a soil test really. 
Um, the whole idea of these sort of training sessions um, that we run in-house usually uh, is about more empowering the farmer to get more of an idea of really what's going on in his soil. And, and this is just another tool that we can use as you're, as you're analysing your soil test to actually find out what's really going on and what's the dominating factor. Um, does everybody call on that one? Yep. Yeah, okay. So I've got a soil sample here. I'm not gonna tell you where it's from, but I know it is from Walgut. Um, this is a chemistry test that we did. Um, and if you have a look at the pH there of eight, um, uh, I don't really go off the water so much. I really go for the calcium chloride. Um, it sits at eight. Electrical conductivity is not too bad. Soluble salts um, is pretty high, even though it's not too bad. Now, if you have a look here at the calcium, see how we've got 3,600 parts per million calcium. Um, you should be running in wheat, chickpeas and parsley. You should be running up around the 4,000 mark. Calcium is extremely important, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll explain a bit more about that. Um, now, if we go down to the next one, look at your magnesium, guys. Can you see that? Can you see that test? Right on red. Brent, is that grey soil or red? Well, it's grey. That's grey soil, that one. Yeah. But it's funny because we've done a few different tests and they all, the magnesium is just off the Richter scale. Um, so what happens by having that magnesium so high, um, there's a few issues that we have with magnesium, but I'll go into that in the next stage. Um, the next thing is there is we have available sodium, which is extremely high. Um, the nitrogen, Nitrogen and sulfur tend to work together. They're quite good buddies. Uh, they're very um, mutualistic friends. Um, as you can see, the nitrogen there at 20, that's, that seems like there's a bit of fertiliser going out to me personally. Um, and sulfur, that would be, I would imagine, would be in the fertiliser. Um, sulfur, sulfur is also indicative of soils that don't drain. Sulfur is very, very readily um, um, leachable. Uh, when you see high levels of sulphur, it tends to tell me what's going on there. So uh, aeration is probably one of the big things that we've got to look at. Um, as for the trace elements, there's a lot of low ele um, trace elements. The extractable aluminium is low, which is great because we don't see that over here. So you're sort of opposite. We have low magnesium soils and high aluminium, which is totally opposite. So, um, but so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to, we're going to talk about magnesium and what it actually does. And I'm sure you guys can, um, can um, give me some, um, um, I'd like your feedback on it because definitely um, it's one of the things that we very rarely see over this neck of the woods. Um, but uh, so what we'll go is we'll go into the next slide and what I'll probably do is bounce back to the soil test just to give you a bit of a, an idea. Um, so magnesium. Magnesium is a component, so it's essential for chlorophyll. Uh, chlorophyll um, is therefore essential for photosynthesis. Magnesium serves as, as an activator for many plant enzymes required for sugar metabolism and movement for growth processes. Plants take up magnesium as an ion, okay? Excessive magnesium inhibits the uptake of calcium and the plant displays general symptoms of an excess salts, uh, stunted growth, and dark colored variation, because we've also got to remember that magnesium is a salt. So being so high, and that's why we're seeing high salt levels or high sodium levels in the soil, it's all to do with that magnesium. I think the biggest thing with magnesium too is that um, on that last uh, paragraph there, magnesium has a greater attraction for water and that has a larger uh, hydrated radius than calcium. So. Basically, long and short of it, calcium, when we do get rain, um, calcium, can, calcium can hold up to 80% of the water that's been, been thrown at it. Uh, whereas calcium, uh, magnesium will hold 80%, calcium is about 20%. Um, so this causes soil particles to remain saturated and poorly drained. For, th for these reasons, um, soils with high magnesium content have less water stable aggregates and less structural integrity, which means they tend to compact 
uh, when wet, these soils tend to swell and become very hard when dry. Is that the case across you guys? Is that what you guys are finding with your soils? Yep. Yep. They get very cracky. Do they crack a lot in summer? Yeah, they crack, crack now. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's really indicative of magnesium, and and um, and this is, I suppose, what I'm going to talk about next is how we're going to sort of start to really get our teeth into unlocking. I, I think at this stage, biologically, I think there's probably more chemistry that we need to sort of focus in, um, and hence why I'm talking about these issues. Um, and we're fortunate enough to be able to have soil tests to be able to, to go back to. But um, I think the, um, the, yeah, the chemistry is probably gonna be one of the key guys and biology will follow. Um, but anyway, we'll go into the next one. Now, calcium. Now I'm gonna, I'm not gonna really read too much off this. Um, I wanna explain to you about calcium and what calcium does. Does anyone have a good idea about calcium? And what his major role is? Not really. Not really? Okay. So calcium is extremely important. It's probably one of the most overlooked um, uh, minerals in the soil. And um, what, we, what we've done over the years, we've done a lot of work in this space. And I tend to find with calcium, calcium is extremely important. So calcium uh, reacts with what we call pectic acid. Uh, to make pectin. So if we look at a plant and in, in between the plant and the cell walls of the plant and, and the cells themselves, there's a glue and that glue is called pectin. And that glue is, is produced by calcium reaction with enzymes in the soil, right? Now, what I've found in particularly working in areas that have, uh, are prone to frost is that when you have um, calcium inside your plant or in your stem and you're getting it to your plant what actually happens is is calcium um, if plants can't get it to it or to the plant what plants do is they fill up with water so when you find that you have a frost for example the the water inside the plant crystallizes and busts the cell walls the plants fall over okay now if you've got calcium or pectin in the plant the plants actually, the pectin freezes at about minus four. So what will happen, but it doesn't crystallize like water does. So, so it's an extremely important, particularly in frost areas, to hold your plant together, hold resilience, um, build stronger cell walls, stronger plants, stronger vascular systems, stronger for, um, for um, um, photosynthesis, so we can we can create, push more sugars through the plant, and so on. Um, the other thing that we're finding as well is that a lot of sap sucking insects. Now, do you guys have much pest problems over there, as far as beetles and or, or not so much beetles, but different um, pests that attack your crops? Yeah. Are, you, are you finding that over there? Yep. Yeah. 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 Well, it's quite interesting. Say that again, sorry, mate. Oh, especially if it rains throughout the growing season. Yeah. 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 Well, what what I've found over the years of experience is that we find that if you've got water in in what we call the interstitial space, which is a space between the cells walls and the cells, if you've got water in there. Most sap-sucking insects, um, well, for example, if you've got pectin in there, sorry, most sap-sucking insects don't actually, um, they can't digest pectin, okay? It's carbohydrate. A lot of them blow up and die. A lot of them can't actually um, take it because it's just, they, they can't absorb it. But when you start to get pests attack and your system is full of, uh, is full of water, they're going to your plants because they want the water, okay? Now you might hear people disagree with that, but I have huge amount of experience in this space and it's definitely one of the contributing factors. Now, being that you guys are lacking uh, a high in magnesium,
guess what guys? We're getting no calcium to our plants, okay? So I think this is probably one of the biggest factors or contributing factors in, in our soils that I'm, and particularly in your soils that will be, will be happening, okay? Um, the other thing with um, calcium is, which I'll, well, let me get any, um, is we'll talk about, and I want to talk a little bit more about calcium as we go down the path, um, path here, but calcium is what we call an immobile. So if we go back up to the top where we had magnesium, magnesium is a mobile element. So basically nitrogen, uh, MPK and magnesium are all mobile. So that means they translocate from the soil up through the plant. Calcium is immobile. So it needs enzymes and biological pathways to actually activate it to make it plant available, okay? Um, extremely important um, to understand that and particularly where your soils are magnesium based so the plants are taking up a lot of magnesium more than they need to take up put it that way okay um mobile nutrients um we have chloride magnesium molybdenum uh, nitrogen phosphorus potassium so they're all mobile uh this is just giving you a little bit of an understanding um if you get on the net, you can actually see, Google a bit about mobile nutrients, immobile nutrients. You tend to find um, when you have plants that are, are nutrient deficient, particularly your phosphorus, your potassium, your magnesium and your nitrogen, you will tend to find that the lower leaves tend to die off because being mobile, it wants to shoot all those nutrients up, right up into the canopy. And if you're lacking those, what tends to happen is the lower lower um, leaves will die first so that they sacrifice to put the, the energy back up into the plant. Do you ever find um, you guys have any deficiencies that you notice in, in, your, in your crops? Anyone, anyone see anything that um, sort of seems to come back rear its ugly head every year? No? Okay, that's all right. That's Beg your pardon? Just moisture. Yeah, just, yeah. Okay. Um, that, that's another story, moisture, and we'll talk about that. Now, just going back to calcium, um, I, I've done a lot of work in this space in calcium. Now, a lot of people out there throw out lime sand, uh, it seems to be the flavour of the month. Lime sand, um, the active ingredient in calcium is calcium carbonate. Um, now, does anyone know how long calcium or, or lime sand takes to solubilise or be made plant available in your soil? Does anyone know the time frame? Long time. Yeah, it can be anywhere between five to seven to ten years before your plant will even get to it, okay? So what I've done is I started bringing in, um, most lime sands here run between 10 and 12% calcium carbonate. Um, I started bringing in uh, medical grade calcium, which runs at about 96.7 or calcium carbonate. So extremely high quality. Uh, it's very, very cheap. Okay. Um, what I started doing was um, looking at um, one of my wheat growers um, last year spent $160,000 just on lime sand. Um, it's, it actually did nothing for his pH, nothing actually changed. His plants were still pretty sick. Um, so I started going on a bit of a crusade and working out that um, calcium needs an extremely low pH to solubilise it and make a plant available. So what I did is I, um, I did, first I, um, I got a couple kilos of calcium um, and we... I put a low pH kelp, which is running between three and 3.5 pH. And I put one litre of that with a couple of litres of water and I added it to my two litres, uh, uh, two kilos, and we solubilised it and, it and it sort of frothed up like an eno. So it was quite interesting. Uh, this is something that we've talked about um, over there, Nick. Is that right? Um, anyway, um, and then we, we've been putting that stuff out 
at around about um, two kilos over 20 hectares on average. Um, a lot of our growers, I've got one grower in particular, um, he's increased his organic dry matter. He's a dairy, dairy producer by 150 to 200 kilos a hectare. And this happened within two weeks. Um, what we're finding by putting that was by solubilizing it, we're taking it from a, from a product which lasts or, or takes five to maybe 10 years down to something that reacts within a week or two weeks. Um, can be easily done on farm. The other thing we started doing is, um, is using um, citric acid, which is very uh, harmless for biology. Um, and we're using small amounts of citric acid. We mix it with our calcium and then actually throw it in there, put water in there and it solubilizes. But it's extremely amazing how we can get that calcium to the plant by just changing the sort of dynamics of what we do. Um, because calcium is going to be your friends, guys, um, extremely limiting in your soil. And that's how we're going to start to buffer our, cal our magnesium out and try start to try and bring some balance. Um, anyone have any questions on that? No? Okay, does anyone know about cation exchange capacity? Anyone know much about that? Can you still hear me? <laughs> Tell us again. Tell us the important bits. Yeah, no, all good, mate. Okay. Now, CEC is extremely important. So this is the, basically the ability of your soil to hold on to cations. So cations are calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, aluminium, hydrogen. So when a plant um, takes water, up through its roots, what it what it does is it it, it um, basically um, pushes about ninety eight percent of the water goes back up to the atmosphere. Um, the water then changes from from um, CO two, and it gets converted in the photosynthesis um, process. And because the the water is required, it, well, it's converted into hydrogen, which the water is required to um, um to to help carry the sugars through the plant so your cat um your cation exchange in your soils um is sitting in around about 25 um percent or 25 um milli, milli, milli equivalents um which is extremely high um that's what you would find in a rainforest so that's indicating to me that your soils are quite clay based is that right in saying that yeah? yeah anyone any takers yeah okay so the, the thing is when you've got clay clay is extremely hot, um, um good at holding on to stuff um and therefore trying to leach things like magnesium and magnesium being a cation it's extremely hard to get it out of the game um and as you can see if you look at my diagram so what happens is uh, the plants swap one hydrogen ion for two calciums or one hydrogen for one potassium, um, two hydrogens for uh, two calciums. So what happens, the plant's forever um, trying to throw um, those hydrogen ions to do swaps. And the higher the, the higher the cation exchange, the higher the ability to hold on to these, these, um, these cations. And this is where I can see the magnesium being extreme um, issue in that regard. Um, because your soil has got the ability to really hold on to it. Um, again, this is where um, uh, aeration is going to be an extremely important part of, of the way we look at how we deal with your soils. Um, so everyone pretty clear on that one? Um, again, it's uh, you, you'll get a copy of all this, and i really love you to um, do a bit more research. Um, obviously, time's a factor, so... Um, the more research you guys can start to put together, the better for yourselves. Um, so go, moving on to the next one is, um, yeah, milli equivalents. That's uh, the wrong page. Sorry, guys. Um, right. So you guys are sitting around the, the, between the clay loam, clay to the heavy clay. You're sort of sitting in that space. Um, 
because you're you you got that. Am I, am I right in saying that you guys are all clay soils? Are they all dominantly clay or not really? Oh, clay's the clay loams. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, well, that's indicative of uh, of um, of seeing this sort of you know, particularly magnesium being a cation. That's why we can see your magnesium so high in your soils. Um, as you can see, if you go down the chart. Uh, we sort of, if you look up the top there, uh, the sand, that's basically West Australia. Um, got no cation exchange capacity at all. And as we go down the page, you can see humus. Now, humus is basically organic matter that has been broken down by biological, um, um, good biology in the soil, which breaks it down and creates humus. Humus is amazing because humus holds on to everything and releases as only as the plants required. Um, humus is is basically the bee's knees as far as soil is concerned, um, and that's something by using biological pathways and using techniques to break down your organic matter, especially residual after harvest, is going to be an important part to start building that that humus and starting to increase the potential of your soil. Shumus holds four to five times own weight in water, to give you an example. Whereas clay, it sort of repels water, especially when you've got lots of magnesium in there. Um, and especially when it's anaerobic and it's compacted, um, hence why we're seeing a lot of cracking and very slimy, slippery in, in winter. Uh, everyone good on that one? Yep. Awesome. Now, um, I'm going to go into talking a bit more about humus, and there's a method to my madness here. Uh, humus, humus is fertile, rich form from organic uh, materials such as decaying plants and animals, predominantly made up of, collo uh, of a colloidal, colloidal form resembling clay, which is a main chemically active fraction of the soil. Humus is five times more effective as clay as a nutrient exchange. Uh, it holds on to both cations and anions. Uh, it's a storehouse for nearly nearly all nitrogen in soil. Um, rich in humic substance can dramatically affect the CEC. Acts as a glue and creating crumb structure. Um, significantly influences soil's ability to store water, and is a storehouse for microbes, nutrients, and water. Okay, so extremely um, um, important guy. Um, but by getting the right biology and really working hard on um, benchmarking the way that you guys are farming, um, we can start to increase that. And we've had amazing successes in that space, particularly in a, a place called Muck and Budden. Um, by putting biology out there in the last two years, we've taken them from about 0.3 to about one in the last two years in, 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 in carbon. Uh, which is quite significant. A lot of people say that they can't be done, but I disagree with what they have to say. Um, the proof's really in the pudding. Now, when we go down to the next one, is soil organic matter. If you see a 0.5%, if we can get that organic matter and we can convert that into humus through, through biological pathways, we can actually increase your water holding by up to 80,000 litres per hectare. Um, it might sound out there, but it definitely can happen. It can definitely work. 1% uh, is 160,000 litres, 2%, okay. Um, and as you can see, up to 5%. 5% um, is really unusual to see that type of soil over here. Down south, we're right down in the, in the bottom of, the, of West Australia. Um, even on our beautiful soils, which is predominantly di uh, dairy farms down here, 5% um, is unheard of. Okay, a um, lot of chemical use that then takes out biological pathways, it's extremely detrimental. Um, and um, do you guys, um, just a question out of curiosity, um, I have the guy that I was working with in Muck and Budden, when we first started with him, he, um, he would harvest and then we'd come back to his place six months later and there was still stubble in the ground. Is that the same as what you guys have got? Is that the same sort of issues? Do you see? Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, okay yeah. then. And, then. and that's just indicative of not having biology. And once you get that biology right, what happens is that that biology can actually break down that organic matter and that's how we start that's one method of how we start to to create um um humus um and that's just indicative i mean if you go to you know you throw a lawn clipping down on the ground or a handful of stuff and, and on a on a normal sort of anywhere it breaks down quite quickly doesn't it you know what i mean and to see six months later that you've still got stubble on the ground that's just a real true indicator that your biological pathways aren't working. Okay. And don't get all um, freaked out about it because it can actually be fixed quite easily. Okay. Um, it's just a process that we have to follow. Um, and, and it's not expensive. Um, I've got growers at the moment. I don't know if anybody's heard of Di Haggerty, uh, Nick Kelly over here. Um, they're quite into the biological side over here. Um, Di Haggerty crops around 35,000 hectares a year. Um, she brews up biology. She sprays that biology on seed. Um, she is running in about anywhere between two to four dollars a hectare. Okay, the initial setup costs are quite expensive. She's still putting in down the, down the hole and down the chute, and I don't have an issue with that. Um, but she, most of my farmers at the moment, uh, if I go up to Wongan, right up north, they're around about $190 um, a hectare just on, on nitrogen. Um, and these guys are cropping around 16 to 20,000 hectares each. So you can imagine their fert bills are extremely. Um, people like Di Haggerty are going in around about 20 litres or, or, 20, or um, about $20 a hectare. Um, with within um, and this is what happens as we start to change the process again even though we um, we're organic I, I don't have an issue with in um, it's just the amount of in we use is, is phenomenal and we've got to we've got to really start looking at that and zoning in on usage is extremely important um, right moving on right has anyone ever tried to put a cover crop in Oh, yeah, yeah. We're using some mixed species, but we don't call them cover crops. Yep. Okay. What do you call them, mate? Uh, cash crops. Cash crops. <laughs> I like that one. Yeah, that's a ripper. Um, cover crops, it's quite interesting because I've been dealing with a guy called Nick Kelly, and I worked with him for about three years in the early phases, and um, he was quite a heavy chemical guy. Used to use a lot, lose a lot of his um, his crop every year, anywhere up to fifty percent to frost. Um, this guy in particular, um, he's in in a place called Newdigate. Um, Newdigate gets up around the forty five degrees, forty to forty five degrees, and it's really deep in there. It's sort of marginal desert, sort of really sort of near uh, Lake Grace, more near near sort of desert country. Um, our third year in he put 400 hectares of sunflowers in and with no, no water. Okay. He put it in straight after his crop was harvested. Um, quite cheap. Um, the great thing about sunflowers is, is that they can get really, really deep and they can give you a lot of organic matter to break down. Okay. I've actually got a picture right down the very bottom. I'll, I'll scroll right down. Oh, where are we? Oh shit. I've lost. Sorry guys. Uh, screen sharing has stopped. How do we do that? Uh, let me see. Sorry, guys. I'm just going to... Yeah. Okay. I don't know what I've done here, guys. So you're just going to be with me for a sec. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. I don't know where I've gone or what I've done. No. Okay. Let me move over. I'm going to have to get my son over here to help us out. Okay, can you see that again, guys? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, this photo here, as you can see, it's very dry. Um, this was, yeah, about 400 hectares all up that he put under sunflowers. Um, now, really poor soil, about 0.3% carbon originally when we first started. Uh, went down the biological pathways, inoculation on seed. Third year in, 
with no moisture or basically no water, uh, he managed to pull off a crop like this. Now, this guy's doing this every year now. Um, these are the sort of things that we're gonna start zoning in on, guys, and um, trying to maximize every potential we can with our, with our, um, with our crops, uh, or with our cover crops, or cash crops, as you call them. Um, right. So these are just ideas, guys, that I really want to um, zone in on and, and try and build organic matter. Uh, organic matter and the biological pathways, obviously, uh, on seed is where we're going to start looking. Um, I don't expect to do this on a, on a grandiose scale to start, I think, as a, as a collective group. I think we need to look at, you know, a pilot trial on 20 hectares and... Um, and with, with some techniques and, you know, like every grower that I work with, we start small and we just grow once everybody sort of educates themselves and gets a good handle on, on, on how to do it. And, um, and I'm more than happy to, to work with you guys to um, implement a program and, um, and get, you, get you guys going in the right direction for sure. Um, now, if we go... Um, right... Now, I'm going to have a talk to you about biology. Now, um, chemistry that I was talking about earlier is sort of one of the things that we've identified over in West Australia in particular, and I'm starting to identify it in, whether in Queensland, wherever you are, has been a big issue. Um, and obviously, biology is, is probably one of the biggest issues that we have as well. Um, West Australia, sandy soils. Uh, very what we call bacterial dominant soils um, um, tend to be really anaerobic, um, hydrophobic. Uh, your soil, or your soils are definitely not hydrophobic, but over here we tend to have really big issues with hydrophobic soils, mm -hmm. extremely bacterial, um, poor. So this little picture I've got up here is what we call the soil food web, and this is just to give you a little bit of an understanding or an idea of of where we're actually at of actually how, how the biology sort of works within the system. My son has just come to help me. Thanks, son. Um, <laughs> sorry, guys. Um, yeah, so if you actually look through, you know, we have what we call succession. So we have birds and animals, and they eat what we call the arthropods and uh, worms and so on. Now, once you start to hit nematodes in arthropods, these guys you can't see by the human eye. Uh, protozoas, fungi, nematodes, bacteria. Um, they're all part of the actual breaking down organic matter and creating stable carbon, which is humus. Um, these guys in particular, um, uh, we're gonna sort of start, start to talk about. Can you see that diagram, guys? Yep, yep. Yep, okay. So um, this is just a, really a snapshot, again, um, I would highly recommend that um, for a bit more education, guys, uh, there's a lady called Elaine Ingham. Have you heard of her? Yes. Okay. I want you, I want you to do a few um, YouTube links to Elaine Ingham. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you the basics now and it will just plant the seed with you guys. But um, moving down this process and, 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 um, and moving forward, um, the more education you can have behind you is going to be extremely important. Elaine Ingham, which I know very well, um, she is an amazing lady. She's been studying soil biology for the last, or well, probably nearly close to 50 years now. Uh, extremely intelligent lady and uh, very, very um, onto what she's doing. Um, so the next picture, oh, at least I, I can't remember it. Run out and grab them, please. Sorry, Matt. Oh, here we go. I'm back on again. Okay. So, what on earth are the numbers? So, in one healthy teaspoon of soil, there are more organisms than there are humans on this planet, which is pretty cool. In one hectare, there should be about 900 kilos of worms. Now, this is in good soil, guys. About 1,500 kilos of bacteria, two and a half kilo, uh, two and a half ton of fungi, 150 kilos of protozoas, and 50 kilos of nematodes. Now, everybody's heard about nematodes. Do you guys suffer from nematode problems? 
No? No. Okay, that's a good thing. Right. Um, contrary to, be to belief, nematodes, 95% um, of nematodes are actually good. Okay. The other 5% are bad guys, like root feeding nematodes, so there's all different types, uh, are usually indicative of anaerobic or poor structured soil. Okay. Bacterial dominant soils in particular. Um, I'm going to move on to the next one. Right. Now, this is a very, very interesting um, chart, this one. This was put together by Elaine, Elaine Ingham. Now, if you go over to uh, the right-hand side there, you see old growth forest. And you can see those little round dots. They're what we call... Um, yeah. Yeah. On those little round dots, they're bacteria, and the other guys are fungi. So in a forest, when we look at a forest, and particularly when we look under our microscope and we investigate, um, a forest should run around about 90% or 80% fungi and about 20% bacteria. Now, what happens is atmospheric, does anyone know much about atmospheric nitrogen? Yep, there's tons of it above us. There's shit tons of it, right? Excuse my French. Now, um, 80, uh, 70, what is it, 78% of our atmosphere is actually nitrogen, right? Now, there's three ways, main, real main ways that we get our nitrogen. One, one way is through um, through when we have lightning or disturbance in the atmosphere where uh, and then we get a bit of rain, that froze nitrogen as a nitric acid. Uh, the second way is through rhizobium, through peas. Um, they fix themselves to, um, and legumes, they fix themselves to the root hairs. They actually infect the root hairs. They can sequester that nitrogen and convert it into plant usable form. Um, the other form is, which is what we call free living. So they're the guys that live in your soil profile. Now, what happens looking at the succession chart, when we get atmospheric nitrogen, it's actually in, in a, an ammonium form. Ammonia is extremely, extremely hard to, um, to digest. So there's only actually in a, in, a, in a fungal dominant system, there's actually only a couple types of uh, bacteria that can actually live in an aerated system, right? Now, from there, the, the lower succession plants need to then break that um, or take that atmospheric nitrogen, which is ammonia, and, and what we call nitrifying bacteria, which actually take it and, and convert it into a usable form, more around the form of nitrates. So as you see, we're coming down to bushes and vines and row crops, highly productive pasture, which is you guys, right? Now, as you can see there, you should be running around about 50% bacteria, 50% fungi, and those other little guys that you see below it are protozoas and nematodes, which I'm gonna explain a little bit more about. Um, now, from there, from nitrites, it gets broken down again to a more simplistic form, which is nitrates. Now, if you look down the very, very left-hand side, you see bare soil and you see weeds. Can you see that, guys? Can you see that one on the very left-hand side? Yep. Yep. Now, see how we have all that bacteria there. See how we've got bacteria we've got one little bit of fungi, right? Bacteria in anaerobic soils is like there's about two species in, in a fungal dominant, which is more of an aerated system, and in, a, um, in a, um, a system which is extremely bacterial, which in your soils that we have looked at under the microscope, they're extremely bacterial. How many people grow weeds? Yeah. Plenty of weeds? Well, I tell you now, guys, by putting fungal dominant extracts or brews, which we're going to talk a little bit more about, what we can actually do is we can actually change your succession and we can bring you back the other way, right? Um, I've had amazing success and I, I, on so many different industries where they've gone from these weed ravaged um, bacterial dominant soils and by adding fungal dominant system, uh, a fungal dominant brews into their system and pull their succession back the other way, we can actually eliminate weeds. So to give you a good example, if you go into a fungal dominant forest, do you see weeds everywhere? No. That's right, because they can't live in that system. So 
purely by adding fungal dominant compost as in brews, and I'll talk about teas and extracts, and this is where we're going to start zoning in on you guys, um, we can actually change that succession of, of biology and therefore change the um, whole, um, yeah, over time it will be. But we can actually change your weed pressure and we can actually eliminate your weed pressure over time purely by getting the right biological pathways in there. Now, the soil samples that we have looked at sort of sit around the 90-10, which I call a 90-10, which, um, which is the weed, weed end of the system. So by in including that biology or the right biology, we can actually start to transform your system and pull you back the other way without using any glyphosate in between that, okay? And we've had amazing success in this space and um, I know we can achieve it. I'm very, very confident, okay? Some, some of you guys might probably think differently, but there's gonna be, um, you know, and I'm not saying that we stop using all these you know, glyphosates and all these things, but we start looking at how we manage and how we use these products. And there's, there's other different techniques that we can use to, um, to actually buffer out the acidity and the, the acidifying uh, effects that say nitrogen and even glyphosate does by simply adding things like humates. Humates is an, an amazing buffer of soils and it buffers out all the bad stuff. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard me uh, Christy, have you have I talked to you about uh, humates, the use of humates? Ah, uh, yeah, I think. And Macy, Nick's used them as well. Okay. Oh, it's extremely yeah. important, guys. It's extremely important, and this is something that we're going to start to we're going to have to start looking at and trying to build resilience into your system. And this is one way of doing it, okay? Because the soils are being beaten up. And we've got to really start to look at how we're going to turn them around. Okay. Right. Moving on. Okay. So um, this is basically what I talked about, about atmospheric nitrogen. Um, really good thing to get on YouTube again and Google um, uh, the, the nitrogen cycle. Um, the more, the more education you guys put in, the more knowledge you will gain. Um, and then uh, hopefully working with you guys to sort of change things around and really start working on it, we can um, start to change what's going on there. Um, right, moving down. Okay, this is a really long-winded thing. Um, this again, talking about nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Um, I won't get right into it. Again, this is probably a read for, for, the, um, for when you go to bed. Um, Nitrifying bacteria, denitrifying bacteria who push um, carbon dioxide back out into the atmosphere. Um, does anybody know the difference? Uh, another really major, major thing with bacterial dominant soils, and uh, there's, a, there's a huge difference between bacterial soils and fungal dominant soils, is that fungi builds what we call macro aggregates or structure. Okay, so they take that organic matter, they break it down, and they create structure within the soil profile okay instead of blowing off carbon dioxide they store it as carbon because it's 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 a um, stable form of carbon inside your soil profile when we get bacterial dominant soils which we're seeing over your neck of the woods is that bacteria soils are what we call micro aggregates which which create anaerobic conditions they create um, um, destruction of structure um, therefore, allowing not allowing your soils to breathe, and instead of storing carbon, bacterial soils blow it off as carbon dioxide. So we're actually blowing off any of that residual carbon that we're trying to or, or, or trying to create, or that humus that we're trying to create. We're blowing it off as carbon dioxide. Um, so you you end up in this 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 constant circle of of beating your system up and um, and 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 um, releasing that that important um, carbon that should be stored and stable, which is blowing it off and giving it away back to the environment. Okay, is everyone cool on that one? Yep. Okay. Next one. Now, now this is going into a bit more 
deeper into the actual um, role of, of, of biology. Um, we have, we talk about fungi, we talk about bacteria. These guys here are called um, protozoas. Protozoas are extremely important part of the system. Has anybody ever tried to get microbes in a packet and put it out there? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, microbes in a packet, you tend to have certain fungal species and certain um, bacterial species. Um, the problem with microbes in a packet is these guys here, they can't freeze dry them. So these are sort of the missing link. So what happens when you have bacteria um, in, a, in a cycle in your, in your soil? So what happens bacteria, do, or what bacteria does, is in order for back, uh, bacteria uses that atmospheric nitrogen that's been converted into, into, into nitrates. Um, they use that as a food source and that's how they, they move around the soil and they distribute sugars and they do all sorts of myriad of different things. Um, but what happens, um, they don't, when they poo, they don't poo out that nitrogen. They, they're only using that nitrogen to work with, right? And, and to, to store, get their energy from. These guys here, ciliates, aneba, flagellates, there's all different types. Um, they actually come in and they take out the bacteria. So they actually eat the bacteria. And when they poo, they poo pure plant available nitrogen. Um, so when you get microbes in a packet, um, these guys are basically the most important part of that whole system because that's how plants get nitrogen. Now you can see ciliates to the left you tend to find anaerobic soils tend to have quite a lot of ciliates. They tend to live in really, um, really um, um, quite compacted and depleted soils. Aneba, flagellates, uh, paracillium, there's a whole heap of different types. They tend to live in more structured aerobic soil. Okay, you do occasionally see ciliates in aerated soil, but you tend to find um, massive numbers in really anaerobic soil. Um, we want to see the aneba and flagellates as we start to build soil structure and start to build good soil. Um, Anebas and flagellates will not live in the environment ciliates live in. They just can't live in that environment. They need oxygenated soil or they need oxygen so that they can actually breathe. And this is where we're creating structure and that's what fungi does, it allows soil to breathe, okay? So next one, the role of fungi. Fungi are heterotrophs, meaning organisms that cannot manufacture its own food. Um, derived from the Greek word hetero, meaning different, and troph, meaning nourishing. Um, so basically, we can look, there's a fungal hyphae on the left-hand bottom, okay? So basically what they do is they have organic acids within inside their, their membrane. The outer membrane of them uh, is made out of chitin, which is crab shell, same, similar um, or same. Um, so what these guys do is they produce um, um, organic acids, basically. So as you can see that picture on the left, see how the fungi is attaching itself to a bit of organic matter? So this is under the microscope. Okay, so he is attaching himself to the organic matter. And what they do is they release organic acids from the inside out, and those organic acids strip out nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, zinc, copper, boron, every, basically every element that we know today, um, because a bit of carbon or organic matter was carbon, like we are, we made up of every element on the planet, basically. Um, so they strip them out. Then what they do is they then, um, they self-absorb them back into their body, all the nutrients, and then they continue to grow. Um, I'm going to show you what they also have a predatory species, which I'm going to talk about next. But the next one is mycorrhizal. Anybody use mycorrhizal fungi? Yep. Yep. Mycorrhizal fungi is extremely important, uh, particularly in, in cropping. Um, are you guys tilling your soils quite heavily? Across the board. Yeah. Quite heavily tilling. Yeah, we I, I work with some guys that go from lots of tillage through to guys that are no till, lots of chemical. 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh that's good. No, that's good. Because what happens, um, well, it's a double whammy there, because what happens is fungi, uh, mycorrhizal fungi in particular, tilled soils kills it, right? And then on the other spectrum, chemicals kill it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's something that's got to be introduced quite um, quite consistently. I tend to put it into my my brews, and when we're inoculating seed, we're, we're, we're getting that inoculation there and then. Um, extremely sensitive guy. He's what we call a mutualistic um, fungi, uh, where he absorbs nutrients from his host. Uh, so they, he attaches himself to a root here. Um, and then what he does, his predominant job, Michael Ryzer, was actually to, to take, um, to um, unlock phosphorus. So the plant will swap sugars and for phosphorus. Phosphorus, zinc, and a little bit of iron, but predominantly phosphorus, that's his gig. So that's how plants get phosphorus in a natural environment. You kill those species off by uh, tilling or not replacing. If you've got a no-till system with very low chemical use, these guys will probably still be in the game. If you're heavy tilling, heavy chems, um, you're basically taking them out, okay? Extremely important. So if, if anybody's seen a picture where you see a picture, um, you would have seen a picture of a plant, and you'll see its root system, and then you'll see all those micro hairs hanging off the sides everywhere. That's basically what mycorrhizal does. Mycorrhizal can actually increase the surface area of your roots um, oh, by 500% uh, purely because he's chasing and and um, and um, chasing the nutrient that it needs, particularly phosphorus. Um, I have found that liquid phosphorus. Does anyone use liquid phosphorus out there? Nobody? No? Mm. Liquid phosphorus is an interesting one because what we've found in the past is uh, liquid phosphorus, because um, mycorrhizal is a natural form of um, a natural um, sort of the, the way plants have designed themselves to, to, be, um, to bring phosphorus to the plant. Uh, what we find is that when you stick liquid phosphorus out there in particular, what it actually does is actually shuts the plant down um, and, and the plant, it shuts down all the receptors on the plant to say, look, we need phosphorus. And that which, which in turn grows the mycorrhizal and what we tend to find, it actually shuts it down and stops the uptake, of, uh, it stops the mycorrhizae from, um, from propagating or, or proliferating in your soil. Um, yeah, quite, um, quite interesting space, that one. The other thing is, is we have Arthrobotrys. He's a really cool dude, this guy. We have about three species down here in the southwest. Um, they're a hoop fungi. So what they do, um, we've had quite good results with this guy, um, where we've put him into golf courses who suffer extreme uh, um, uh, nematode issues. And basically what this, this guy does, he forms a little hoop, and what he does, he, he, he secretes a, a pheromone, which the, the nematodes um, sniff it out and go, yay. Um, and particularly with the bad guys, um, tend, to, tend to love them. Um, so we've had good results at reducing populations by using arthrobotrys, where we, we impregnate that into the soil. And basically what happens, the, the nematodes come towards it. It has little sticky globules on it. And the nematodes get stuck to it. It injects, um, it injects itself into the nematode and basically sucks its guts out. Uh, really cool little dude, actually. Uh, he, sound, he doesn't sound really nice, but um, yeah, really good way of biologically controlling opposed to using nematodes, in which are commonly used over in West Australia. Um, everyone good on that one? Yep. Cool. Okay. Now, I was talking to you about uh, nematodes earlier. Um, now, fungi stores all its good, good um, all, all the nutrient inside its body, uh, extremely um, strong outer cell walls, um, which are made of chitin. Uh, so extremely, extremely robust, but very sensitive in that, in that same, same thing in, in regards to chemical use. Um, as you can see, there's, there's, there's five there, um, there's, there's thousands of them. Um, you've got a bacterial feeder. So you tend to find those guys where there's lots of bacteria. 
Uh, B is a fungal feeder. So if you look at, at the top of his head there, you can see there's a little spear-like thing that's running up to the top of his head. That's actually a, a spike. So what he does, he comes up to the fungi and he pushes that spike through the side walls of the fungi, has a bit of a feed and releases plant available nutrients to the to the to the plants and this is all happening around the rhizosphere of the plant or the root zone uh extremely efficient um when you see those guys you know that you've got your soil is pretty good um the next one is a root feeder uh it's got a big knob on the end um he's uh extremely detrimental guys um he can he can take a um a root system that's 300 mil deep in the ground and within a week, it can be basically no roots left. Uh, extremely detrimental. Um, and when they get going, they like anaerobic conditions. When they get going, they're extremely hard guys to stop. Um, how we how we attack these guys is by putting the next two, which is a predatory and an omnivore. So we impregnate those into the soil, and that's another way of controlling outbreaks. Uh, again using bio biology to, to work for us instead of using these nasty nemesides that are out on the marketplace. Okay. Next one. Right. Many conventional inputs have detrimental effects on soil biology, pesticides, herbicides, fungal, fungicides, soluble fertilizers. These effects are uh, cumulative mm -hmm. and they have a long-term implications on soil health and humus development. Do any of you guys spray over there like this? Crop dusting? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, pretty very, very detrimental. Um, again. But you know, the whole the whole idea is we we start we change we start to change these sort of techniques and um, and working on, on on more efficient ways of making it work. Okay. Uh, composting. I I'm, I'm a mad composting man. Um, it was interesting going back when I first started and the agronomist said to me, you've got to put, you've got to put manures in your compost and looking around at my trees and, and looking at those trees and going, well, they've got no manure and they're growing quite fine and dandy. So um, I went on a journey of, of, um, of discovery really. And um, our compost that we make is quite extremely quite different to most conventional compost. Um, I, I don't use any manures at all. I use pure wood. Now, the reason I use wood is wood is, um, I always look at it, look at it from a, from a point of view is that 80 or 98% of our planet is bacterial dominant, right? 2% is, 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 is fungal dominant. The only thing that bacteria can't eat is wood. Okay. They can eat straw stubble. They can eat, you know, the pectin and, and, but they cannot digest lignin or cellulose. It's extremely complex. The only guy that can do that is fungi. Okay. So I make all my compost out of wood, pure wood. So we're extremely, extremely high in fungal dominance. Um, that's why you need very little of our product. The other thing is, is that we turn very little because the more you, I, I, and I mimic that on tillage of soil. So we turn probably, I used to turn about 30 times and over a whole process. Now we turn about eight times max. Um, our, our compost runs. So if you go into a forest for a rainforest, for example, a rainforest will run about 25% carbon. We run between 22 and 24%. Um, our cation exchange, so our ability to hold on to um, to minerals, runs at around between 50 and 60 uh, mill equivalents, which is extremely high. So it's extremely high end, um, loaded with biology. Therefore, you need very little amount, and that's hence why we do liquid brews. Um, to give you a bit of an example, one cubic meter um, made into compost teas. Uh, will cover about 800 hectares, okay? So there's one cubic metre I'm talking. So extremely high quality and um, you don't need much, okay? Um, so there's, there's a few different ways. There's a static compost, a thermal compost, which is basically heating the living daylights out of it. Um, 
I I did a lot of studying on on pasteurisation turning, and um, I come across a paper written by um, Louis Pasteur. Um, Louis Pasteur was employed in the beer industry back in the early 1900s to work out why beer keeps spoiling. And um, well, good job. He wasn't a beer drinker actually, but. Um, he, he had worked out between 55 and 60 degrees was the optimum temperature to keep out your lower beer spoiling microbes and your higher beer spoiling microbes. So I cooked between 55 and 60 degrees and no hotter. And I found over many years of testing our compost that that is the absolute sweet spot. Um, and so we keep it at very low temperatures. All the composting facilities I know over here, and I've been to a few around the world, um, they all run up between 70 and 80. Once you get past that 65 degree mark, you kill off all your beneficial fungi. They do not survive. And he's one of our biggest guys. He's our biggest limiting factor that we need and it's extremely important in our soil profiles. Okay. Everyone happy with that? Yep, yep. fantastic piece of information. Yeah, awesome. Now, if you have a look at that middle picture, that is actually a worm farm. Now on that worm farm, I stuck 13 different species of, um, of, of, of um, cover cropping. So it's got tillage radish. It's got, it's got every different species that um, help develop um, that microbiome. So by doing that, we're actually, we're breeding um, nitrogen fixing by, uh, bacteria. We're breeding um, um, fungal species. Now, that, that worm rose there, it's quite interesting, um, going back to nature again, and this is what a lot of my stuff is based around and, and seeing what nature's doing and, and sort of mimicking what nature does. Those worm farms have had no nitrogen. I don't feed them any food scraps. All I feed them is our compost. Because worms, does anyone know what worms predominantly eat? Oh, bacteria and fungi. Exactly right, mate. You're right on the money. They eat biology. That's their main food source. You know, when we see them eating on a bit of lettuce, they're actually eating the biology off the lettuce. You know what I mean? And these worm rows I have here, these got up to a metre in height. No nitrogen, nothing, just compost put down. And and I put initially put worms in there. I used to grab handfuls and handfuls of worms. It's just unbelievable. And then, um, you know, I slash it and then more compost on top, and that's how I build my worm farms. I don't use any food scraps at all, okay? We're just using nature to do nature's job, okay? Extremely high quality. That, that, that worm rose there is probably enough to inoculate about 50,000 hectares, those two uh, worm rows, okay? So it's not all about making... Spoken. What's that, sorry? I was too busy encouraging these guys to listen that I didn't hear it myself. Just back up. Yeah, well, see those two rows in the middle, the two worm rows? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that's enough there to do about fifty to 60,000 hectares inoculated. Okay. So where, where I'm coming from here is it's about the quality of the product that you use. There's so hmm. much garbage out there on the marketplace, which is so highly bacterial dominant. And this stuff here is just so fungal dominant. And because we made it out of pure wood, which fungi, that's their main predominant food source. Mm. Um, so you don't need to make massive, go into composting and make massive rows. It's about less is more. And it's about being able to produce a product which is extremely high end. And what, what's the average farm size out there, guys? Just to give me a bit of a heads up. 300,000 acres. 300,000 acres. So what's that in the hectares? That's about, what's that? Bloody... I only talk hectares, sorry. 1,000 <laughs> hectares. Yeah, we'll see. You, yeah, you're probably looking at a couple cubes. Crazy, eh? It sounds, it sounds funny, but it's real. And I'll tell you now, last year alone, so what did we do last year? Last year was 75,000 hectares we treated across West Australia. Um, this year was a little bit lower down. I think we were around about 50,000 hectares. But, um, and you know, you've got people like Di Haggerty, she'll buy a road train a year. That's it. 
and she'll do her 35,000 hectares on that. Uh, plus she does other things and trialling and playing around. I think the biggest the biggest um, cost in this is not so much the compost, but it's more the setup cost. Because as you can imagine, Di Haggerty is doing it at 50,000 litres a day. Um, extremely big volumes, um, but extremely big farm, as you can imagine. Um, at a thousand hectares, it's extremely doable, extremely doable um, on a on a on a quite a cost effective. Because we've got to make it cost effective, and that's the key. Um, Di Haggerty is running in at about two to four um, dollars a hectare. That's what she's running in at. Opposed again to the conventional guys that are going in really hard. Um, you know, the, these guys are up to two hundred dollars a hectare. Most of the guys I deal with, and we're slowly bringing them back. Um, okay. So good stuff. Composting is going to be something we're going to look at again. A uh, very important part of the whole process. Uh, worm farming is going to be the gold. If we can get our hands on some wood chip guys, and we can make a row that would one row would probably service the whole lot of you guys, I reckon, which would be exciting, wouldn't it? Um, right. So compost, humidified compost. Now, this applies to worm castings as well, extremely humified, uh, rich in humus and beneficial microbes, increase soil biology, induce um, disease suppression, stimulate root development, increase water holding capacity, increase CEC, reduce nutrients leaching. Um, I've got some pretty interesting photos, but I haven't put them on this presentation, but uh, uh, Di Haggerty, uh, we did some brews last year. Um, they on their wheat crop. Now you're talking 0.3% carbon guys. So you're talking very low carbon guys. Um, so very poor water holding, uh, very, you know, very marginal sort of areas as well. Um, we managed with, um, with the biology inoculated and put on seed. Um, we had with five mil rain, we had over 300 mil root depth in, in seven days to give you an idea of how we can get it right. If we do it right. You know what I mean? Um, she's one of many that we've had that same sort of result for. The deeper we can get the root straight off the bat, the more potential we've got to um, to get to that that lower um, that lower water level, and be able to use as, utilize as much water as we can. Extremely important. Okay, and that's the difference between the longevity of your crop. Um, when you've got those sort of roots sitting in that subsurface, as soon as it gets sort of dry, we, we start to fall apart. And I think that would be pretty, um, pretty reasonable sort of comment to say over there. Am I right? Right. Um, next one. Right. This is a real exciting bit. Um, aerated compost tea. Okay. This is sort of where we're going to be heading with you guys. Um, Whoever wants to jump on the bandwagon, which is going to be really exciting. Um, liquid compost brews contain billions of soil microbes. So to give you an example, uh, a teaspoon will hold about three to four billion microbes on average, some more. Um, so what we do is we get those microbes and we, we put about 10 litres in a bag, in, a, in what we call a tea bag. We then, um, we then put that tea bag into an aeration tank. Um, the aeration tank runs at about, well, it's got to be running over six parts per million. Um, and then what happens is the aeration, because we know that good biology lives in aerated soil. So by aerating, what we're actually doing is we're turning on all those aerated biology or biological pathways. Now, that whether that's bacteria, beneficial bacteria, beneficial fungi, nematodes, protozoas, and so on. Um, every 20 minutes, so you can imagine if one teaspoon has three to four billion microbes um, and we put 10, 10 litres in a tea bag, we suspend it in the water, we aerate. So every 20 minutes we aerate for, we actually double the population in that bag. So most of the growers will go out between 30 to 50 litres of liquid um, per hectare, okay? And that's on seed. Um, so in order to, um, depending on what types of biology we want to turn on, um, we add things like fishes and kelps. I add amino acids. I add all different types of things, um, a bit of um, uh, soil wetters, 
which are all organic certified. Um, by simply adding those food sources, what actually happens is we actually then drive the um, the, the the biological. Um, it's, it's a food source for the biology that we're breeding. Okay, we breed in that biology over a 24-hour pe um, period. So you can imagine every 20 minutes we're doubling the population. So you can imagine after 24 hours how many microbes we're actually getting. So in one drip. Um, after a brew is done, you're probably talking, oh, oh, I, I can't tell you, trillions and trillions and trillions of microbes in each drip. So once we start to put that on seed, um, yeah, you watch the space, guys. It just, it's just, it's amazing what it can do. It's absolutely amazing what it can do. Um, we also, how we, um, not only do we um, add the, um, the food sources, what we should call biostimulants, we also add um, our calcium and particularly over here, magnesium, which is our missing link. Um, I would also like to add a bit of magnesium into your, into your brew. And it sounds a bit ironic that you've got really high magnesium soils, but what actually happens by adding magnesium into your, soil, uh, into your brews, you actually are activating the enzymes, which are actually going to digest the magnesium. So, and we found, found this is, is the case. Um, so then what happens, we're adding those extra enzymes in there, which will also help to dissipate the excess of magnesium that we have in the soil. Is everyone happy with that? Yeah? Right. Aerated. Oh, I lost the page. Oh, yeah, it's flash. Okay. So aerated, this is another, um, this is another, um, basically the same thing again compost quality must have good it's got to be a grade compost if you if you have a bacterial dominant compost which is made made um, without any love um, you will aerate and you'll basically get nothing out of it uh, the other thing is is chlorine do you have chlorine in your water over there or are you pulling out of bores yeah oh, yeah okay beautiful well what we tend to do when you're pulling out of water sources that you're unsure of the quality what we tend to do is just we aerate for 30 minutes prior to putting everything into it um and that that just helps with um it just helps blowing off any excesses um particularly chlorines or anything that's in there or sulfurs or whatever blows them off a bit and then it uh, it just it sort of basically softens your soil, makes it a bit more open, makes your um, your water um, just more um, more um, available, I suppose, in a, in a sense. Um, yeah, molasses, fish emulsions, kelp, humic acids. These are all the different things. Everybody's slightly different. Um, when I recommend food sources for people, that food source is based around what I'm looking at uh, under their soil. Uh, and also based around their chemistry. Um, and, and, and that's what I base it around. So some people are slightly different. Uh, we see dramatic differences, particularly over here. Uh, like I say, aluminium is an extreme issue. Um, so calcium has been one way that we've actually locked the, um, the aluminium out. Um, but again, in brews, we go higher rates depending on what we're doing, lower rates depending on what we're doing. Um, so you, you guys, I would definitely be putting higher rates of calcium in there, um, uh, in the brews, but we, we solubilize that prior to putting in with our brews. Uh, it doesn't affect your biology. We've done lots of work in that space as well. Uh, extremely, extremely, um, good way of, um, yeah, getting it out there. Um, uh, any of you guys putting anything similar to this or anything like this down, you, down the chute as you're seeding or not? Uh, this year I did some trials and we used uh, worm castings. Good. Uh, silicates. Yep. And, uh, and a calcium prill. Calcium so that's prill. a micro, microfine lime that they yep. turn into a prill. Calcium prill is bloody amazing, mate. Calcium prill is amazing. And you know how I'm talking about calcium? So are you talking about Homia products? Yep. Mate, best in the business. You can't give it better than that product, mate. I've done so much research and dealt with so many different products. That product is absolutely the best in the business. 
the issue that I have with pooled products is again, you, um, you, you're not getting that solubility. You know what I mean? And this is where, um, I, I use their two, what is it? Two micron, um, same, basically the same product, but it's in a two micron powder. Um, mate, you can't get a better product. It's, it's, it's medical grade, extremely high end. Um, but one, one, one ton should at least do anywhere between five to 800 hectares as well. Okay. But solubilizing is going to be the key. And I know that we try and, um, be as efficient as we can. And we don't want to be driving back up and down and over and over trying to spray bloody different things out. And this is where I've, um, through lots of research and lots of work in this space um we have managed to incorporate the two together uh the calcium um uh, micronized calcium and also micronized uh, magnesium which is also loaded with um which is also loaded with silica and iron which is important for photosynthesis um by adding those two guys in and solubilizing it prior to mate you, you won't believe the difference it's uh, you're on the right track what you're doing there definitely i love it it's good to hear um but soluble mate we want to get it soluble we need to get it plant available and we need to get it happening quicker than you know what i mean we don't want to be waiting five years you know what i mean we want to get it in there and get it going but you're definitely on the right track mate solubilizing that is going to be the way to go by far okay right um right yes if you look down the bottom of that thing now, I've got limited shelf life as organisms are active. Now, has anyone ever tried to buy um, a container of biology, um, a 20 litre container of, of biology, and it's and it's basically doesn't have a shelf life really, does it? Has anyone done that? And it's got a six month shelf life or a year shelf life or whatever. Um, this, doing it this way, you have 24 hours to get it out. That's it, or it dies. And that's what sort of frustrates me a lot. There's a lot of products out on the marketplace, say rich in biology. Now, if that if that biology was live, right, it would not last longer than 24 hours. 36 hours, it starts going anaerobic and it will completely die and it smells like a dead animal, okay, to give you an example. So this stuff is the real stuff. This is the stuff that we're gonna produce which gives us a 24 hour life cycle and it's got to be out on seed. Okay. If you lose it, if it starts to smell anaerobic or smell off, we do not use it. Okay. Cause we are sticking live biology into that profile. It's probably the biggest downfall. Um, hence why a lot of people use extracts over aerated brews. So extracts is not sticking aeration into it. It's just washing it with big mixing, uh, mixes. I think I, I think I'll talk about this next one. Yeah. So they they um, they have no air, no food. Um, all you're actually doing is washing the biology off, and the biology sits in all different forms. It sits in a spore form. Um, so basically, you're washing it. Okay. Um, myself personally, I do both. I do extraction and aeration. Some of my growers the smaller sort of growers, um, the sort of 5,000 to 8,000 hectare growers tend to do both because they can manage both. Uh, when you get to people like Di Haggy, they just do extracts only. Um, I like the best of both worlds because what you tend to find is um, by sticking aerated brews out, and this is this again through experiences, aeration you're turning every single thing in that bit of soil in that in that compost you're turning every single thing on whether it's in the spore form whatever form it is you turn it on um so it's like a massive hit right it's a massive hit when you um when you do extracts you're not actually turning everything on you're washing it so therefore you need a lot of biostimulants before it goes out so you add your fishes and cows depending on what you need and they they hatch or the the, the spores um, come alive, but they tend to be more of a longer term scenario, whereas they stay in your soil over a longer period of time, whereas the aerated ones are more about 
taking it on. It's like going to war, right? They go to war, they start really working and beating up uh, bad biology. They start, um, they start um, 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 cycling. They start pulling out toxins. So it's sort of uh, where it's so it's a it's a quicker hit, whereas um, extracts are more of a longer term base. You know what I mean? But I think you guys are at that size where. What's that, sorry? Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Right, so um, just on this, the aerated and the... Um, extracted, extracted, yeah. So one of our plans that we're doing over here now is so that we're in sync with the, the change in the season. Yeah. Is that we want to, be, want to be planting dry, both in the winter and the... Oh, more than likely dry. Yeah. Uh, coming off our summer... Uh, we're planting dry going into the into the winter to get yep. to be in for the first shower of rain and that cha that change of season. Yep, I get um, you. Yep, you know, like we're at we want to be in the starting blocks when the season starts. Yep, I get you. First shower of rain. We've got a fair yep. few growers over here doing exactly the same, mate. They're in the same boat as you. Yep. Right. So the question is there. If we are going in dry, um, that aerated stuff that might be pumped up and living, yep. um, ready to go, or then the other one, like the extracted where it's still in its, um, uh, you know, fun or spore form and yep, that sort yep, of thing. Yep. Um, what, what, do you, what are your ideas there? Just oh, I, I, I would go extraction. Yeah, right. I'd, be, I'd be going extracts. I, I think... It's sort of a double whammy for you guys because we've got such anomalies with your chemistry as well as your biology. Um, you know, I've got guys that went in twice this year. So they went in on seed and then they went in once the, once the um, everything was up, then they sprayed instead of uh, injecting into the soil profile, they just sprayed on top and these guys oh, had yeah. quite an amazing result. So, um, it depends where you are. Muck and Budden, they go and dry every year. Um, but he still uses biology, but he extracts predominantly, yeah. Right. And you might find that you go in with an extract first and then you come in with an aerated, um, if you if, you know what I mean? Because a lot of people do, I don't know about you guys, but most of my growers tend to do three to four applications a year, or, or not a year, but over a growing season. Um, predominantly with with um, nitrogens and all those other things, but obviously we're changing that around a bit. Um, and a few of them went twice this year with with amazing results. But um, again, uh, extracts on seed and aerated on on their um, as a backup over top. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I th and I think, mate, and this is where it comes back to. I really. You know, I don't, I don't want everybody to go out there and do a thousand hectares. You know what I mean? It's, it's not about that. Um, it's about also educating and learning and, and, and learning yourself as we go through the journey, because it is a journey. Um, and it, it's extremely important we start on a smaller scale. Um, but that doesn't mean, um, you know, I was talking to, to one of my growers that I've had for about three years, the first year, and I said, look, let's just do 20 hectares, and he ended up doing 5,000 hectares. <laughs> so everybody, you know what I mean? Everyone's different. Um, but I think, um, you know, there's going to be all different types of techniques. There's going to be all different types of responses, but I think generally across the board, um, you know, this is the future, what we're doing here. Um, you know, if we can get away from having to do three or four, how many, how many applications do you do in a year? Uh, in a season, sorry. Uh, when we're doing biologicals or doing the... Well, just, yeah, just doing your natural system, the conventional yeah, system. Uh, yeah, we usually like a knockdown spray or something and then an in-crop spray. Yeah. And then depending on disease pressures and that sort of thing, yep. like, um, yeah, um, you know, like a fungal spray or something like that. Yep. Or an insect spray coming into, yep. into the spring, into the spring. Well, that's 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 pretty typical, mate. Um, yeah. yeah, and you know it's quite interesting because once we start to do this, and once you start to, you know, because on a smaller scale, you can probably go over it. You know, you can you can throw bloody compost brews, you know, three or four times while you're playing because you're playing on a smaller area, 
and and I mean, again, it's educating yourself. Um, the only the only thing that I really um, I really get a bit weirded out about is that we have very minimal carbon, right, and very minimal organic matter. So the more biological processes you put in place, particularly the fungal species, if you don't keep contributing to that um, that biomass, where in, in um, when we're talking about um, you know root systems and going back to cover crops and all those sort of things, you're going to deplete your carbon extremely quick. So we've got to be mindful that it's all strategic on what we try and do. Now I have had growers back in the early days that you know, we're sticking four bloody brews out in one go. And then they'd just, they'd just leave everything go. And then, you know, they weren't, you know, the, the wind had come and blow their tops all away. And, mm-hmm. and, um, and then after, after three years ago, and shit, our system's collapsing around us. And, and, I, and when we started doing more research on it, we found that they, these guys had gone from, excuse me, from, from 0.5, 0.6% carbon down to 0.2. So we're actually depleting their carbon by using too much biology. So there's a real fine line that we've got to approach with that. You know what I mean? And that's why testing and looking under the microscope is extremely important for us because we want to make sure that, you know, moving ahead, we're making decisions based on reality opposed to shoot from the hip stuff, you know, it's extremely important. Um, But yeah, I think you're really heading in the right track, mate. And it's good to hear that um, you're doing this. It really is. Um, so yeah, compost extracts, extracts, um, I've got a big mixing vat for extracts. It's got a, um, it's got a, um, uh, basically a big motor on the top and it's got a paddle and it just paddles around and I just leave my compost in there. I, I usually leave it for 24 hours cause I'm usually, cause I cross, I, I, I bring the two together. Um, with the extract system, you can have product ready in two hours. Okay. So you can do large numbers extremely quickly um, and you can have it out there and it lasts a lot longer. The shelf life on that can be up to a week. Okay. Because what you do, you're extracting uh, using a vortex basically is what we do. Um, and then when you pull it out, of the tank and most guys have have their big brew tanks which um you know Di Haggard is 50,000 litres she pumps out of that into a 50,000 litre storage tank uh, most of my other guys pump out into you know 25,000 litre tanks um and then they add their food source then okay and that's what activates the spores and starts to turn everything on but on the scale you guys are at um you sort of got the best of both worlds I think it's, it's a lot smaller, which is which is good, you know. I, I, I like the small, uh, you know, because you can actually work with your system opposed to trying to fight against it to get your system up and running and, you know what I mean, you can sort of zone in a bit better. Right. Um, longer shelf life. Sorry, Brent, can I ask a question? Sure, can. We've got um, a reasonably local family, Magnamine Farms, that are creating compost at Canamble. Yeah. And they're selling a compost prill. Is that right? That is designed to go in the, basically in the fertiliser bin and applied at 20 to 30 kilos per hectare. Yeah. Is that right? I just, could you make any comment on that? Have they, um, do you know how they're prilling it? Are they using clays or, because a lot of people tend to use clays. Heat is another thing which kills your biology. Remember, I was talking about the 70, you know, once you get over 65 degrees, a lot of them use heat so that they actually sterilize the product. It, it's a good carbon source, yeah, but there's a lot of other ways of making carbon and, and making and making really good carbon. And I'm not I'm not saying anything bad. I, I um and again is what's it made out of? Is it made out of wood, which is which is what fungal need? Or is it made out of of uh, pectin based? Predominant, pre- pre- predominantly manure from a nearby feedlot. Yeah, lot. yeah. See, I'm not. Yeah, no, I, I'm I'm not a. Yeah, I, I don't use any manures at all. I don't use one ounce of manure in any of my products. We produce around about uh, twenty thousand tons of compost a year, um, and I don't use any manure. All I use is biology. Okay, mm-hmm. um, I have looked at prilling. But the problem I found is there's no real, a lot of them will use either clays, they use molasses. 
Now, molasses is a massive bacterial driver. We don't want to be putting molasses in there. Um, manure is a big bacterial driver, okay? Um, if we can relate back to the forest again and start thinking down that path, um, a forest isn't, you know, nobody goes out and throws 10 tonne of manure per hectare. You know what I mean? There might be through, yeah, obviously through animals that run through it. But, I mean, nature's makes its own manure, which is humus. You know what I mean? Um, down the chute, I think, I'd, I'd love to see some product. I could tell you exactly. Once, uh, you know, it's hard to say until you actually see what um, what it is. And, and the great the great thing about looking at a mi under a microscope, and that's something we're going to look at as, again down the track, is that um, a microscope don't lie. You know, you can kick the dirt and say, "Oh, this is amazing. This is biological. This and biological that." And um, but a microscope don't bullshit. Excuse my French again, but. Um, that, that's the ultimate way to, to determine where your soil actually really sits is by looking at it under a microscope. And there's no lies, you know. And I've seen so many products out in the marketplace um, and, and really well-known products out there saying there's biological, rich in biology, this, and, and they've got nothing in them. There's nothing in them. They're just biostimulants, fishes and kelps and, and shoemates and fulvics and all these bloody amazing things, and they're all good things, but what they are, they're stimulants. They're not actually, you know, they're not actually full of biology. Yeah, they're not alive. Um, the way we do it is we're bringing it alive. But, look, personally, I think, um, I think it's a good way of adding organic matter to your system. But ultimately, at the end of the day, if you don't have the diversity of species, it doesn't really matter what you put down there. You know what I mean? Did that answer your question in a really long-winded way? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, until you have a look at it under microscope, then you can really, yeah, really make the real defined um, assumptions on what it is. You know, I, I, don't, I don't want to bag anybody out or do the wrong thing, um, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, it's, you know, like I say, the microscope don't lie. That'll tell you the true cost. But anyway, at the end of the day, anything that you put down there, um, you just got to be mindful of what you're actually trying to achieve. And that's where education is extremely important because we can throw anything down. And that's what I tend to find with a lot of growers. Is they tend to throw everything, every, you know, every salesman that comes through, they tend to throw something down there, but it's not necessarily, um, yeah, it's yeah, it's not really creating the right um, environment, and if if anything, it just creates more antagonisms, and um, yeah, it's not it's not healthy. And this is where education is power, and this is where you guys education is extremely important for you guys. Okay, uh, add food source when applying, uh, better suited to broad acre and pasture. Oh, biostimulants. So there's all different types of biostimulants. Um, I actually, I'm not trying to plug my own company, but um, I found that when I when I started doing lots of teas and brews, on average, we probably do about 150,000 um, litres of brews a year um, in growing um, ourselves for all of our other customers, whether it be in Reveg, avocados, whatever. Um, what I tended to find is when I started um, brewing up, all these different types of biology. I was putting different food sources. I put organic food sources. I put all different types. And what I'd do is I'd come back in the next day and all my bio, all my brews were dead. They just smelled like a dead animal. And it was just, and I just sort of, I got really frustrated, you know, because you put so much effort and time into it. And um, so I, I started making my own products. And then, um, just so that I knew that I was feeling 100% comfortable on the types of products I, I knew myself because I'm pretty anal about my little buggies, um, making sure that they they were right. So I started making my own products and now we sort of have a big range of different products. They're all certified organic. Um, we bring in uh, amino acids from Italy in particular. Amino acids are an extremely important part of the biological system. Um, they, um, for example, going back to calcium is there's two, two amino acids, which is glytumic acid and glycine. They actually increase the, um, the uptake of calcium by over a thousand times. So simply by adding certain things in, we can actually 
we can actually really fast track. And that's why when we use smaller amounts of calcium, um, the, um, the turnaround you can see within two to three weeks. It's just phenomenal. Um, but we're using certain, certain um, aminos to trigger the enzymatic things that go on within the soil. Um, so yeah, and we do a wetting agents, which I bring in from Mexico. They're, they're made out of um, yucca plants. Uh, concentrated, uh, extremely high in saponins and saponins, uh, something that I'd like to have a play with with you guys over there. Saponins, um, when you throw water out, do any of you guys use soil wetters? Yeah. Yeah? No, well, not soil. Um, yeah. You mean wetters for uh, putting out the herbicides and that? Yeah, do you use any, any type of wetters at all? Yeah. You always use wetters because everybody's on such low rates of water. Yeah, no, that's right. And and but you know the quite interesting thing, mate, is this and this is years of, of, of doing this again, is that saponins, which is the active ingredient in yucca, do some research on it, it's quite interesting. But so what saponins does is makes water wetter. That sounds silly enough, but what happens is water will always travel down the path of least resistance. So it tends to follow down those same pathways. But what actual um, saponins do is actually opens those pathways for more um, for more pathways to be created, if you get what I mean. So it makes that area bigger. Um, we had an interesting guy where we had a 70 hectare blue gum plantation over here that was taken out. And the guy's been trying to rehab it for the last four or five years. Anyway, we had about 400 mils of rain and I went out to his property and um, he... I, I hit the top surface of the sand and there was probably about a two mil penetration of water. It was just amazing. And this, this stuff that we, that I brought over from Mexico for, we have a bit of a play and 200 mils, we used a liter and a half and 200 mils is roughly for about a hectare. Um, I went in about, a, I think it was a liter and a half over about 16 hectares. So it was way below what the recommended rate was. Um, then we had about another hundred mil of rain and, uh, sorry to be rude to you guys talking about rain, but, um, um, uh, I went at, back out there after we had that rain and we had about 30 mil of percolation of water. It was just phenomenal. Um, just an amazing product. It's not detergent based. Saponins are actual food source. They're a carbohydrate for microbes as well. So extremely amazing product. And I'd, I'd like to um, probably get some over there so you guys can have a bit of a play um, and um, just see what we can do in that space as well, um, particularly when you're what, using... Yeah, yeah mate. Uh, how are you, oh, sorry. Brent, what, what are the sort of um, costs of these products? Um, just varies, mate. And, it, and it, see, not all these products are what you want either. You know what I mean? There's certain products that we need to work on. Do any of you guys use fulvics? Fulvic acid? No, I don't think Roger does. You don't use it? Yeah, Roger, one of the other guys that's uh, in this group does, I think. Yeah, fulvic acid is an extremely, um, extremely bacterial driver. So a lot of people push fulvics and I'm, I'm sort of, so what you have is you have two, two forms. You have humic and fulvic, right? Fulvic is in its organic state. Fulvic is in its diluted state. Now, when you look under a microscope, for example, when I have a look at a bit of organic carbon, it's black, right? Now, once fungals um, taken out all the, all the um, nutrients and all the minerals out of that carb, bit of carbon or organic matter, then what you're left with is this, this opaque sort of a brownish, light brown, coffee colour brown. That's when bacteria can eat it because all the, all the lignans and, and, and um, cellulose has been digested out by the fungi. Um, and a lot of people really push um, um, fulvates, uh, fulvates really hard. And I tend to disagree a bit with that because I think you've got to go in with the um, with more the organic form, or it's a bigger it's a bigger ion as such. Therefore, that promotes that's a fungal food as well. You know, it promotes fungal. Um, it gives fungal a chance to digest and break it down, whereas fulvic is it's past that phase, and and it's not a really a food source of fungi. And fungi being the limiting uh, um, biology or biological species in your soil in particular, and same as over here. But um, 
Yeah, I mean, look, I, my products on the market are probably cheaper than basically every product out there, to be honest. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but I, I sort of, this sort of thing started purely and it wasn't, I wasn't intentional to go and start a business at it, but I was just so frustrated with everything dying. So, um, and that's sort of how that came about. And um, yeah, but they are on our website. Um, you can have a bit of a squiz and uh, if you're interested. And, but again, it's all about finding the story first and having looking at your biology and then recommending, because I'm not going to recommend stuff that you don't need. Okay. There's no point in doing that. Okay. Just back on your wetter one. Yeah. On your wetter. And you said that you had, what was it, the non wetting sands or whatever. And yeah. Um, you got some there. One trouble we have here oh, is with our red soils and that if they get a bit crusted. Oh, yeah, definitely. Been, if they've been cultivated and then let get a bit bare, they'll get crusted. And then yeah. another thing we see lots and lots of is this clay pan stuff. So it's like sodic country yep. uh, that's lost the vegetation off it. And then if you it just if you dig it up, it collapses every time. Yeah. Um, how would that those saponins go on that sort of country? Well, it's quite an interesting one, mate, because saponins is um, they sort of like I say they they don't follow the same pathway that water does. They do to a degree, but they actually open up and they can create they can actually create more pore structure in your soil. Uh, it's a bit like fungi, you know. They, they're a really interesting saponins. There's not been much work done on it, but um, what work that has been done is they know that it, it is extremely um, good at creating structure and binding um, um, soil particles together. Um, and that's sort of how it sort of penetrates. It's, it's an unusual thing. Now, the other thing is the zero, your soils are like the way they are. They're cracking is because the bloody magnesium, you know what I mean? And, and, and that's your problem. And, and sodic soils are coming because, you know, magnesium is salt. So, you're seeing that high sodium levels in your soil and that's all to do with magnesium. And, and that's why I sort of started the first bit about, about uh, chemistry because it's extremely, it's going to be one of the biggest challenges is, is looking at that, at that chemistry and really trying to make that chemistry sort of, sort of change it. And I, I know from what work we've done is this is where the, ma the, the calcium is going to be in a crucial bloody part of this whole, whole, whole system, you know, and and if we can if we can break that magnesium up and, and disperse it with, you know, with biological enzymes with with calcium, so calcium then becomes a, a player, because what happens when we talk about um, antagonisms? What happens? It locks calcium out completely. But if you can make calcium that you know calcium that takes five to ten years to solubilize, if you can make it soluble straight up. Wow, you watch it'll 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 out out compete the magnesium, and that's when our soil profiles will start to change, and we've done it so many times, and it's quite exciting actually for me. I think um, I think there's we can do something really cool there, but uh, yeah, chemistry is your big limiting factor at this moment. You know, did that answer your question? <laughs> oh no no, we're, yeah, we're not into complete answers all the time straight up like. It's always a big discussion that's got to keep going on and on and on. Oh, I totally agree, mate. I, lo I love where you're coming from, mate. And it, it's it's extremely important. And, and y you know, uh, it's always going to evolve and you've got to continue to evolve. And it's like me, you know, six months ago I was doing, uh, I thought I was there and then all of a sudden you, you evolve into a different industry and then you come up with new ideas. And you know, I've been doing that for many, many years. And, um and it's quite funny because a lot of the people, like I deal with scientists and all different walks of life, and I, I tend to find that the modern day system is very um, dominated by the, the money train, you know, and it's not necessarily the right reasons. And um, I, I think education is, is the most crucial part of this whole thing. And we've got to start thinking differently. We've got to start thinking uh, you know, with an open mind. And I think we, we're controlled by the agronomy system and we're not allowing ourselves to um, sort of educate ourselves or dictate our own terms. And this is, this is what this is all about. It's about empowering yourself to become a better farmer and, and to, to fix what's, what we've done. You know what I mean? And I'll tell you now, mate, 
yep. I can give you lists of growers that work with us and, and um, they, they're all excited, you know, and, and I've been doing this for a long time and, you know, we in mining, whether it's avocados, we, we're doubling yields in avocados with no nitrogen. How do you do that? Well, you get the right biology, you sequester that nitrogen from the atmosphere and we start putting that back into the, into the, into the plant. I mean, a plant only needs 2% nitrogen to grow, but it needs a consistent supply of that 2%. And that's the difference. Look at nature, you know? Anyway. Brent, I'll... can I, sorry, Brent. Yeah. Most of us in this group, um, well, out here is a reflection of our rainfall and I guess our soil type. Um, yep. We, our age, a long fellow, our summer rain. Yep. Um, very uncommon for us to have three crops in a row, three like subsequent years, yep. particularly, particularly at the moment. So since 2012, I'd say most people have had three to four winter crops. Yep. Um, are there any special considerations for us on those long forced fallows that go for years? Well, I, I, again, I think, you know, the only way out for this is really about soil health and, and building humus so that we can hold we can hold moisture. I mean, I've got I've got some growers there uh, up in um, Karoo and Kanama. They 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 got 120 mil this year, but they still have pretty good crops. You know what I mean? But what's happened over the years? They're starting to build that carbon in their soil, so they they instead of you know getting 100 mil and 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 basically losing 80 percent of it to to evaporation or whatever they're actually probably storing 80% of it now, whereas they weren't before. And this is about, this is all about this, this creating um, organic matter, breaking it down into humus, because humus is the guy. He, he's the guy that's gonna hold on, and this is what carbon can do. So we've got to work really on, on um, trying to increase that, that, um, that soil um, potential, you know what I mean? And, because we're not gonna do it the way we're doing it now, we, we're gonna lose it, you know what I mean? And if you look at, at magnesium holding 80% of your water, that's why we get slippery and we crack and all these other things because it's, it's taking all your water. We're not getting the water that we need down in the profiles. But, um, yeah, look, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really keen on this space. I, I think, um, you know, we get lots of challenges thrown at us and, and have had many. Um, and this really interests me and particularly this really interests me because I think there's, there are ways of doing it. And uh, I think until you actually start doing it, you don't really know, you know what I mean? Um, did that answer your question? But I think we can do more and it will all come back to soil health. If we get that right, then um, watch the space. And you know, the other thing too, which I don't know if anyone's aware, but when you, when you have a pasture that's fallow and it's sitting there and it's got nothing growing on it, um, your soil temperature can, can be anywhere between five to 10 degrees hotter than a soil temperature that's higher in carbon. Did you know that? So therefore, your, um, you know, when it comes to growing, your um, system doesn't stay in the game as long. You know what I mean? You right with that? Brent, you mentioned, you mentioned um, aeration before. Yes, extremely um, important. Yeah, how, how, how would you sort of suggest that we could sort of tackle that with our environment these soils? Um, look, I have, have um, we, we've done a lot in this space. I mean, it's quite interesting because, and especially up in the clay base, base up in Geraldton Way, which is right up north, northern uh, West Australia, they have, they're probably very similar to you guys where they have a lot of clay. Um, we use what we call a pinwheel machine. I'll have to, um, I'll have to get some photos and share them with you guys. Uh, it's quite an aggressive machine. It's a big, bloody massive thing. Um, and it's got big, basic, basically big Rio bar pins and they punch her in through the clay. Um, obviously, timing's probably pretty important um, because you need a bit of moisture around to penetrate. But again, it's like when you aerate, um, when you aerate uh, biology, um, obviously, you're turning on the good guys, right? When your soil is, is compacted and, and anaerobic, 
as soon as you start running pinwheels and start to aerate, then all of a sudden you're actually you're actually aerating your soil and you're turning on all those spores that are sitting dormant, waiting for that for that aeration to come. If you get what I mean, extremely important, and I think it's going to be a really um, it'd be nice to pinwheel and also drop calcium um, in a liquid form down a hole. It'd be amazing. But um, yeah, aeration is going to be. Um, I'll send you a few of the the things. So this guy that uh, made this machine cost him about six grand, I think, seven grand. He made it himself. It's probably about four and a half meters wide. Uh, extremely, you can fill it up with water to make it heavier. Um, he just pins wheels the buggery out of everything. Um, it's definitely something we need to look at. I think the more aeration we get into our soil without tilling it. Um, and this is probably one of the big things with tilling is that they, they have identified that when you till your soil um, uh, and you turn it upside down, you, you potentially lose anywhere between 80% of your stored biology and carbon. Uh, it goes off as carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Um, and this is where pinwheels don't do that because right? you're not tilling your soil right over. They're, they're puncturing your soil, but they're also allowing the soil to breathe and you're not exposing all your biology and, and residual carbon to the atmosphere. Does that answer your question, mate? <laughs> yep, thank you. Yeah, aeration is going to be really important and um, that's something I reckon we look forward to, to working with and working on anyway. Is there any other questions, guys? You can see that photo in front of us. See that one to the left-hand corner? See that one in the very left hand top? Is it your left hand? Now that, that's in 0.3% carbon in muck and budden. Inoculation uh, extracts, uh, that was six weeks um, with biology on seed. Now he, he goes in dry too, okay? If that answers your question about dry. Um, that guy in the middle there, that's one of the golf courses that we work with. See how he's got no roots? That's very indicative of, of what soil nematodes can do to your system. They can just absolutely destroy your root zones. Um, yeah. Any more questions? <laughs> Any? No? Uh, uh... With you, like uh, you were talking about, you were travelling around and getting fungi and that sort of thing out of forests. Yes. Um, and you bought them back and used them to inoculate your mulch. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what What if you hadn't have brought, gone and got them and bought them back? Would your mulch got them going by themselves? Well, um, yes and no. And, and this is again something that. I want to try and do with you guys as well. I mean, you know, um, the thing about using mulch is I, I bring from the local local um, shire or the city of Bustleton where I live. Uh, we bring in yeah. around about 20,000 cubes of mulch a year. Now, I did an audit down there years ago and we identified over 300 different species of plant. Now, every single species of plant has different fungal diversity um, a lot of them are cousins and uncles and aunties, um, but they all serve a purpose for, you know, for example, we've got a lot of Jarrah over here. Now, Jarrah has about has, a, has about five different fungal species that break it down, extremely hard, hard hardwood, 25% carbon, um, whereas your lower successional species have three, two to three. They, they look the same, but they're actually um, very different. Um, they work on different processes. So the more diversity you have in your wood, um, hence why I went to different forests. So I went to a Jarrah forest, a Carry forest, a Mary forest, all these different forests to bring all those guys together. Um, and diversity is king. And yeah. and this is something that we would be definitely looking at around. And, and you probably don't have many forests, but leaf litter, anything that's around there is going to be extremely important. Okay, and they're, they're going to be implemented into your system for sure, definitely. But yeah, it's definitely a way to go. Any more questions? Oh, 
Oh, there's a question on the chat. Is there? Oh, sure. Let me have a look. We're you getting rain and lightning ridge again. Okay, yeah, is that, that's all the way down. I'm a bit of a mere male when it comes to this stuff, guys. Uh, What's the question? Is that the one about rain? No, there's another one just popped up there. Can you guys read it out? I can't find it here. Wait a sec, I'll just get it up on our end. Sorry, I, I don't, yeah. My son's gone, I don't know what to bloody do. So Jenny's, um, so this question's from Jenny Dunlop. Yeah. And she is part way between Walgood and Lightning Ridge. Yep. And she said, did you receive and test soil from our light red clay pan soils? Some of our areas are more grazing areas. They just grow galvanised aluminium jelly burr. Yeah. Um, it gets hard forming cover. What do you suggest we Again, do to get more grazing? Well, the, the only soils we really tested was uh, Nick's and, um, and, and Christie's soil. Um, again, until you really, until you look at the real true picture of what's going on, it's really hard to, um, to actually, um, yeah, to be specific with it. Um, you know, that's one thing I've learned that, you know, it's all good to, to, um, to say whatever you want people to hear, but at the end of the day, it's, it all comes back to that soil result. And, um, and that's when you can be really true to what you're trying to achieve. Um, Instead of just yeah saying that yeah it could be, but you know if it's an aluminium issue that's quite an easy fix. I mean that's one thing we've got really right and uh, we can do quite easily. Again, it comes back to the calcium, building stronger cell walls, building stronger plant. But uh, until we really test, it's really um, so we do chemistry in the biological test. Uh, it's about three hundred fifty bucks for the whole thing. It's about a five or six page um, document with recommendations and all those sort of things. Um, but until you really do that, it's really hard to sort of um, speculate, I suppose. And that's what we don't do. Is that a good answer, Jenny? <laughs> she said, okay, cool, no problem, thanks. Awesome. <laughs> okay, wicked. Um, yeah, but um, if there's any other questions, I think, um, what we'll do is um, we'll put an email together with a few different links for you, and and um, and I think um, you know I, I definitely you know see the challenges that you guys are facing, and I could understand that. Um, we have similar problems in our wheat bout over here, um, as in. The rainfall's getting less and less. Um, some of these guys are getting to the stage where they're walking off the farms, especially right up north in Northampton uh, and, and further inland. I mean, I'm, I'm on the coast. Um, our growers, uh, probably our last grower would be probably around the 900 to 1,000 k's inland from us. Uh, they're right on the desert country. So um, these guys are just getting pushed off the land and hence, why these changes are coming around and they're, and they're really thinking about the way they deal with things and how they do things. And uh, a bit like yourself. And um, I think it's, I think it's really, I think it's achievable and I don't think it's the end of the world. And I think it would be, um, you know, I think collectively as a group, if everybody sort of come to some sort of consensus where, where you start on one farm or you, you will collaborate on, 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 trials on different farms, I think that would Sometimes, be, yeah, yeah I, I think um, that would be a winner. Um, but yeah, I, I think we can achieve things. We definitely have in the past and, and we will continue into the future. Um, but yeah, so look, I look forward to working with anybody that wants to work with us and, um, and sort of guide us and educate and help as much as I can. Um, that's what we're about. Uh, yeah. So any more questions? Go through the question, Brent. Um, yeah. With our soil biology, is it is it more beneficial to have a plant in the ground growing, you know, all year round, or or alternatively have a you know a winter crop like we sort of traditionally grown and then stubble over the summer? Like, is it more beneficial to the you know the bugs and soil biology to actually have a 
have a summer crop going or is stubble, you know, does stubble serve a purpose in itself? Oh, definitely, mate. Look, and, and I mean, but it's it's all about it's it's all about whether you can or you can't, really. I mean, it's easy for me to go. Let's go and put out cover crops because we got rain, and you know what I mean. And, and we can we can sustain that. Um, but extremely important. I mean, you know, this is why a lot of my growers were, um, for example, um, they were the the yields are getting less and less. So what's happened over you know this is um, over years, and hence they've come to us, is these guys were basically you know, they're, they're cutting right down to the ground and they've got no stubble left. And um, and some do, some don't. And and what's happening, the more stubble you take out of the ground, then the more organic matter you, you haven't got, you know what I mean? And um, But by putting crops through those, those summer months it is important because what happens is you're still photosynthesizing, you're still producing sugars, you're still dropping them, them out to the root zone and you're still feeding that biology. So you're actually keeping it alive. Um, you know, beer earth policy is um, definitely not the way to go. But then you've got to be able to sustain a, a crop in summer, you know what I mean, or a, or a cover crop or whatever. Um, but, yeah, definitely very beneficial. I'd be looking at going higher in my stubble. That's if it suits and everyone's different. Um, but I think we sort of need to keep working towards that process and as we do grow like like Walgut um not Walgut bloody um Newtigate and and um and the wheat bout there you know he was a guy that all his topsoil would blow away and now he's growing sunflowers in the middle of summer I mean with no irrigation of any form but we're finding we're building this carbon this carbon's growing and growing and growing so he's got more residual deep lower so he has the holding power um to stay in the game longer you know did that answer your question? Yep, thank you. Awesome. How do you think, guys? Well, I think I'll wrap this up. We will um, definitely get some information through to you guys. Um, and, yeah, if you if you want to know more, my number's there. Um, more than happy to chat to you guys and uh, have a discussion uh, about anything you're doing. Uh, any, any other ways we can start looking, particularly... Um, if you're going to start throwing products out, we can start buffering them out by using things like humates and stuff. Um, most of that stuff we can get over the eastern eastern states. Uh, I don't have to ship my products over to you guys. There's a lot of operators over there that can supply. Um, it's just knowing the right people to supply it, that's all, uh, which I do know. Um, so, yeah, any any questions, please don't hesitate to call me. Um, my ears are always open. And I'm always more than happy to talk, okay? So thank you very much, guys. Really appreciate you coming along. And um, I look forward to talking. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.